So, hi everybody, and I realize that this last two videos are broken up into small videos, and I apologize, it was some problem with my iPhone that I got figured out today, so uh, we're going to continue reading with the story where we left off of the Krishna book, so please accept my respects, and we were reading as we we're getting right into the, the actual beginning of the, the, the Rasa dance. As the gopis and Krishna danced together, a very blissful musical sound was produced from the tinkling of their bells, ornaments, and bangles. It appeared that Krishna was a greenish sapphire locket in the midst of a golden necklace decorated with valuable stones. While Krishna and the gopis danced, they displayed extraordinary, extraordinary bodily features. The movement of their legs, their placing their hands on one another, the movements of their eyebrows, their smiling, the movements of the breasts of the gopis and their clothes, their earrings, their cheeks, their hair with flowers. As they sang and danced, these combined together to appear like clouds, thunder, snow, and lightning. Krishna's bodily features appeared just like a group of clouds and their songs were, of, were like thunder. The beauty of the gopis appeared to be just like lightning in the sky and the drops of perspiration visible on their faces appeared like falling snow. In this way, both the gopis and Krishna fully engaged in dancing. A very beautiful description. The necks of the gopis became tinted with red due to their desire to enjoy Krishna more and more. To satisfy them, Krishna began to clap his hands in time with their singing. Actually, the whole world is full of Krishna singing, but it is appreciated in different ways by different kinds of living entities. I love that because, you know, actually one of the most important scriptures in the Vaishnavas is the Bhagavad Gita, which means the song of God. So Krishna is singing. This is confirmed in the Bhagavad Gita, Yayatha Mam Prabhadyante. Krishna is dancing and every living entity is also dancing, but there is a difference in the dancing in the spiritual world and in the material world. That is expressed by the author of Chaitanya Charitamrita, who says that the master dancer is Krishna and everyone is his servant. Everyone is trying to imitate Krishna's dancing. Those who are actually in Krishna consciousness respond rightly to the dancing of Krishna. They do not try to dance independently. But those in the material world try to imitate Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead. The living entities are dancing under the direction of Krishna's maya and are thinking that they are equal to Krishna, but this is not a fact. In Krishna consciousness, this misconception is absent. For a person in Krishna consciousness knows that Krishna is the supreme master and everyone is his servant. One has to dance to please Krishna, not to imitate or to become equal to the supreme personality of Godhead. The gopis wanted to please Krishna, and therefore, as Krishna sang, they responded and encouraged him by saying, Well done, well done. Sometimes they presented beautiful mu music for his pleasure, and he responded by praising their singing. When some of the gopis became very tired from dancing and moving their bodies, they placed their hands on the shoulders of Sri Krishna. Then their hair loosened, and the flowers fell to the ground. When they placed their hands, on Krishna's shoulder, they became overwhelmed by the fragrance of his body, which emanated from the lotus and other aromatic flowers and the pulp of sandalwood. They became filled with attraction for him, and they began to kiss one another. Some gopis touched Krishna's cheek, Krishna cheek, cheek to cheek, and Krishna began to offer them chewed betel nuts from his mouth, which they exchanged with great pleasure by kissing. And, they, and by accepting those betel nuts, the gopis spiritually advanced. The gopis became tired after long singing and dancing. Krishna was dancing beside them, and to alleviate fatigue, they took Krishna's hand and placed it on their raised breasts. Krishna's hand, as well as the breasts of the gopis, are eternally auspicious. Therefore, when they combined, both of them became spiritually enhanced. The gopis so enjoyed the company of Krishna, the husband of the goddess of fortune, that they forgot that they had any other husband in the world. And upon being embraced by the arms of Krishna and dancing and singing with them, they forgot everything. The Srimad Bhagavatam thus describes the beauty of the gopis while they were rasa dancing with Krishna. There were lotus flowers over both the, their ears and their faces were decorated with sandalwood pulp. They wore tilak and there were drops of sweat on their smiling mouths. 
From their feet came the tinkling sound of ankle bells as well as bangles. The flowers within their hair were falling to the lotus feet of Krishna, and he was very satisfied. As stated in the Brahma Samhita, all these gopis are expansions of Krishna's pleasure potency. Touching their bodies with his hands and looking at their pleasing eyes, Krishna enjoyed the gopis exactly as a child enjoys playing with the reflection of his body in the mirror. When Krishna touched the different parts of their bodies, the gopis felt surcharged with spiritual energy. They could not adjust their loosened clothes, although they tried to keep them properly. Their hair and garments became scattered and their ornaments loosened as they forgot themselves in company of Krishna, company with Krishna. While Krishna was enjoying the company of the gopis in the rasa dance, the astonished demigods and their wives gathered in the sky. The moon, being afflicted with a sword of lust, began to watch the dance and became stunned with wonder. wonder. The gopis had prayed to the goddess Kashyani to have Krishna as their husband. Now Krishna was fulfilling their desire by expanding himself in as many forms as there were gopis, enjoying them exactly as a husband. So we remember from our story of the... Um, Krishna stealing the garments of the, the gopi girls. They had prayed to goddess Katyani, goddess Durga, um, which many girls will do. People will pray to, to Durga to have a good partner, material partner, but they had actually prayed to goddess Durga, goddess Katyani, for Krishna. So here, here it was that Krishna was fulfilling that desire. Srila Sukadeva Goswami has remarked that Krishna is self-sufficient. He is Atma Rama. He doesn't need anyone else for his self-satisfaction. Because the gopis wanted Krishna as their husband, he fulfilled their desire. When Krishna saw that the gopis were tired from dancing with him, he immediately began to smear his hands over their faces so that their fatigue would be satiated. In order to reciprocate the kind hospitality of Krishna, the gopis began to look at him lovingly. <coughs> they were overwhelmed by the auspicious touch of the hand of Krishna. Their smiling cheeks shone with beauty, and they began to sing the glories of Krishna with transcendental pleasure. As pure devotees, the more the gopis enjoyed Krishna's company, the more they became enlightened with his glories, and thus they reciprocated with him. They wanted to satisfy Krishna by glorifying his transcendental pastimes. Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, the master of all masters, and the gopis wanted to worship him for his unusual exhibition of mercy upon them. Both the gopis and Krishna entered the water of the Jamuna just to relieve their fatigue from the rasa dance. The lily flower garlands around the necks of the gopis were strewn to pieces due to their embracing the body of Krishna, and the flowers were reddish from being smeared with the kunkuma on their breasts. The bumblebees were humming around about in order to get honey from the flowers. Krishna and the gopis entered the water of the Jamuna just as an elephant enters a water tank with his many female companions. Both the gopis and Krishna forgot their real identity, playing in the water, enjoying each other's company, and relieving the fatigue of rasa dancing. The gopis began to splash water on the body of Krishna, all the while smiling, and Krishna enjoyed this. As Krishna was taking pleasure in the joking words and splashing water, the demigods and the heavenly planets began to shower flowers. The demigods thus praised the super-excellent rasa dance of Krishna, the supreme enjoyer, and his pastime with the gopis in the water of Jamuna. After this, Lord Krishna and the gopis came out of the water and began to stroll along the bank of the Jamuna, where a nice breeze was blowing, carrying the aroma of different kinds of flowers over the water and land. While strolling on the bank of the Jamuna, Krishna recited various kinds of poetry. He thus enjoyed the company of the gopis in the soothing moonlight of autumn. Sex desire is especially excited in the autumn season, but the wonderful thing about Krishna's association with the gopi, it, gopis is that there was no question of sex desire. It was, as clearly stated in the Bhagavata description by Shukadeva Goswami, avaruda sharatya, namely the sex impulse was completely controlled. There is a distinction between Lord Krishna's dancing with the gopis and the ordinary dancing of living entities within the material world. In order to clear up further misconceptions about the rasa dance and the affairs of Krishna and the gopis, Maharaj Parikshit, the hero of Srimad Bhagavatam, told Shukadeva Goswami, 
Krishna appeared on the earth to establish the regulative principles of religion and to curb the predominance of irreligion. But the behavior of Krishna and gopis might encourage irreligious principles in the material world. I'm simply surprised he would act in such a way, enjoying the company of others' wives in the dead of night. The statement of Maharaj Parikshi was very much appreciated by Shukadeva Goswami. The answer anticipates the abominable acts of the Mayavadi impersonalists who place themselves in the position of Krishna and enjoy the company of young girls and women. So oftentimes we've talked about Mayavadis or impersonalists who believe that they are the all in all. And so therefore a lot of times they play out these scenes of the gopis and Krishna believing that they are all parts <laughs> and, uh, you know, engage in abominable acts of sex. But here Bhaktivedanta is explaining that there was no sex desire. This is a transcendental event between Krishna and the gopis. The basic Vedic injunctions never allow a person to enjoy sex with any woman except one's own wife. Krishna's appreciation of the gopis appeared to be distinctly in violation of these rules. Maharaj Parikshit understood the total situation from Shukadeva Goswami yet to further clear the transcendental nature of Krishna and the gopis in the Rasa dance. He expressed his surprise. This is very important to, in order to check the unrestricted association with women by the Prakrita Sahijas. In statement, Maharaj Parikshit had, has used several important words which require clarification. The first word, Jugupshitam, means abominable. The first doubt of Maharaj Parikshit was as follows. Lord Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead who has invented himself in, in, to establish religious principles. Why then did he mix with others' wives in the dead of night, enjoying and enjoy dancing, embracing, and kissing? According to the Vedic injunctions, this is not allowed. Also, when the gopis first came to him, he gave instructions to them to return to their homes, to call the wives of other persons or young girls, and enjoying dancing with them is certainly abominable according to the Vedas. Why should Krishna have done this? Another word he used here is aptakama. Some may take it for granted that Krishna was very lusty among young girls, but Parikshit Maharaj said that this was not possible. He could not be lusty. First of all, from the material calculation, he was only eight years old. At that age, a boy could not be lusty. Aptakama means that the Supreme Personality of Godhead is self-satisfied. Even if he were lusty, he does not need to take help from others to satisfy his lusty desires. The next point is that although not lusty himself, he might have been induced by the lusty desires of the gopis. But Maharaj Parikshit then used another word, Yadupati, which indicates that Krishna is the most exalted personality in the dynasty of the Yadus. The kings in the dynasty of Yadu were considered to be the most pious, and their descendants were also like that. Having taken birth in that family, how could Krishna have been induced even by the gopis? It is concluded, therefore, that it was not possible for Krishna to do anything abominable. But Maharaj Parikshit was in doubt as to why Krishna acted in that way. What was the real purpose? Here's the question. Another word Maharaj Parikshit used when he addressed Shukadeva Goswami is Sufrata, which means to take a vow to enact pious activities. Shukadeva Goswami was an educated brahmachari, and under these circumstances, it was not possible for him to indulge in sex. This is strictly, strictly prohibited for brahmacharis and what to speak of a brahmachari like Shukadeva Goswami. So Shukadeva Goswami, remember, was the son of Srila Vyasadeva, the very exalted personality and a pure devotee. But because the circumstances of the Rasa dance were very suspect, Maharaj Parikshit inquired for clarification from Shukadeva Goswami. Shukadeva Goswami immediately replied that transgressions of religious principles by the Supreme Controller testify to his great power. For example, fire can consume any abominable thing. That is the manifestation of the supremacy of fire. Similarly, the sun can absorb water from a urinal or from stool, and the sun is not polluted. Rather, due to the influence of sunshine, the polluted, contaminated state becomes disinfected and sterilized. One may also argue that since Krishna is the supreme authority, his activities should be followed. In answer to this question, Shukadeva Goswami has very clearly said that Ishvaranam, or the supreme controller, may sometimes violate his instructions, but this is only possible for the controller himself, not for the followers. 
Unusual and uncommon activities by the controller can never be imitated. There we go. Shukadeva Goswami warned that the conditioned followers who are not actually in control should never even imagine imitating the uncommon activities of the controller. A Mayavadi philosopher may falsely claim to be God or Krishna, but he cannot actually act like Krishna. He can persuade his followers to falsely imitate Rasa dance, but he is unable to lift Govardhan Hill. We have many experiences in the past of Mayavadi rescue, rascals deluding their followers by posing themselves as Krishna in order to enjoy Rasa Lila. In many instances, they were checked by the government, arrested, and punished. In Orisha, Takura Bhakti Banod also punished a so-called incarnation of Vishnu who was imitating Rasa Lila with young girls. There were many complaints against him. At that time, Bhakti Banod Takura was a magistrate and the government deputed him to deal with that rascal, and he punished him very severely. The Rasa Lila dance cannot be imitated by anyone. Shukadeva Goswami warns that one should not even think of imitating it. He specifically mentions that if out of foolishness one tries to imitate the Rasa, Krishna's Rasa dance, he will be killed, just like a person who wants to imitate Lord Shiva's drinking of an ocean of poison. So you oftentimes you have these followers of Lord Shiva who are called Shaivites, and they, you know, say, well, Lord Shiva smoked ganja or marijuana, <laughs> or, you know, and so Bhakti Vedanta Swami was often said that, you know, if a, if a follower of Lord Shiva should be, want to smoke marijuana because Lord Shiva apparently smoked it, then they should also be able to drink an ocean of poison and be fine. So you can't always imitate the, the devotees, great devotees, or um, like Lord Shiva or uh, the Supreme Lord. Lord Shiva drank an o ocean of poison and kept it within his throat. The poison made his throat turn blue. There, Lord, for Lord Shiva is called Nila Kanta. If an ordinary person tries to imitate Lord Shiva by drinking poison or smoking ganja, or marijuana, he is sure to be vanquished and will die within a very short time. Lord Sri Krishna's dealings with the gopis was under special circumstances. Most of the gopis in their previous lives were great sages, expert in the study of the Vedas, and when Lord Krishna appeared as Lord Ramachandra, they wanted to enjoy with him. Lord Ramachandra gave them the benediction that their desires would be fulfilled when he would appear as Krishna. Therefore, the desire of the gopis to enjoy the appearance of Lord Krishna was long cherished. So they approached Goddess Kashyani to have Krishna as their husband. There are many other circumstances also which testify to the supreme authority of Krishna and show that he is not bound to the rules and regulations of the material world. In special cases, he acts as he likes to favor his devotees. This is only possible for him because he is the supreme controller. People in general should follow the instructions of Lord Krishna as given in the Bhagavad Gita and should not even imagine imitating Lord Krishna in the Rasa dance. Krishna's lifting of Govardhan Hill, his killing great demons like Bhutana and others are all obviously extraordinary activities. Similarly, this the Rasa dance is also an uncommon activity cannot be imitated by any ordinary man. An ordinary person engaged in his occupational duty like Arjuna should execute his duty for the satisfaction of Krishna that is within his power. Arjuna was a fighter and Krishna wanted him to fight for his satisfaction. Arjuna agreed, although at first he was not willing to fight. Duties are required for ordinary person. They should not jump up and try to imitate Krishna and indulge in Rasa Lila and thus bring about their ruin. So in the Bhagavad Gita, this was, you know, Arjuna's dilemma. He, he wanted to go off to the forest to be a great yogi. And though he was a kshatri and Krishna was laying out the reasons why he should engage in his duty and not uh, lead others astray by his activities of just going off and not doing your duty for Krishna. But you do your duty as a fighter in this case in the service of Krishna without attachment for the results. This is known as karma yoga. One should know with certainty that Krishna had no personal interest in whatever he did for the benediction of the gopis. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, Namam Karmami Limpanti. 
Krishna never enjoys or suffers the results of his activities. Therefore, it is not possible for him to act irreligiously. He is transcendental to all activities and religious principles. <clears throat> he is untouched by the modes of material nature. He is a supreme controller of all living entities, either in human society, in the demigod society, in heavenly planets, or in the lower forms of life. He is a supreme controller of all living entities and of material nature. Therefore, he has nothing to do with religion, religious or irreligious principles. So Krishna is a source of all religious principles and all Vedic rules. And, and so... Oftentimes people say, why, why does Krishna do it that way? That's not very moral. You know, like the British in India, they were like, well, Krishna's dancing with all these gopis. It's not very moral. So they immediately put themselves in the place of being the well, the controller and enjoyer and, and judge over Krishna, you know. And uh, that's not very uh, efficient in the religious principles which were set up by Krishna, you know. But Krishna is beyond karmic reaction. Krishna is, is the, the uh, Paramatma. We are just the Atma. Very minuscule, uh, minuscule compared to the Supreme Son or the Supreme Lord. So that's all for today. And that this is sort of like, if you go back to those last two videos, I'm going to post a video before this one. Um, they, these are the ones that got cut off of all of them. But we will continue with the Rasa Leela dance uh, chapter. There's still more to go in there. And we're going to chant a little bit. Thank you very much.
Okay, honey bowl, thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Aloha.